Hello directors, today we are talking about week four, which is addition and subtraction. And um, so let's get started. The first thing I do, I set a timer for five minutes and we do number knockout and I don't let it take any more than five minutes. I usually do the battleship number knockout, which I talked about in week one, but just set a timer, do number knockout however you want, but just don't let it take more than five minutes. And then you'll move into the front of the page. If you want, set a timer for 10 minutes so that you're not going more than 10 minutes for this front. Um, I just heard some feedback that it's hard to get through stuff and it definitely is. And so sometimes the timers just kind of help out. Um, but in terms of the cover, um, I talked through the artwork. So it's called Leaping for Lily, which is actually the um, PhD, Dr. Gilpin, who wrote this um, along with Lee. Her daughter actually made this uh, digitally, and so it's her artwork. And then ask the kids how it relates to addition. Why do they think that it was chosen for the addition week? And so they might talk about how the frog looks like a topping on a number line, and number lines are something we're familiar with and they've been doing for a long time. Um, and they have been doing addition for a long time, but we're going to talk a little bit more deeply about addition and subtraction, maybe in ways that they're not used to. Then we go through and read the quote and read th uh, through the reflection. And so again, asking them why were these chosen for the week on addition and subtraction. And then on the quote from John um, Wesley, I just kind of mentioned that he was the founder of the Methodist Church. So kind of letting them talk about this, anything they want on the cover, but shouldn't be any more than 10 minutes, okay? And now we're gonna jump into more of the math. So, um, oh yes, and ask them to point out where they are on the compass page. So seeing which week they're on, having them mention that again, make sure that they realize where they're at, it's still checked for them. And then, okay, now we are going on to the I2 page and discussing this. And this discussion of this page and the next page should be no more than 20 minutes. I'm going to go through a lot of things because um, on the tutor training, Dr. Gilpin kind of shows a bunch of different things and different common, five common topic items that you can talk about. It doesn't mean that in my class, I actually get through every single one of those topics. So if you're feeling like it's just overwhelming, there's too much, you're not expected to go through all of that. I just list them all out in, in the, lesson plans and in these videos so that you can pick what you want to talk about and it gives you some different examples but don't feel like you should be getting through all of it because even I don't get through all of it um, in class there's just not time especially if the kids are actually understanding and asking questions they're probably going to spend more time on one topic so you're not going to be able to get through all of the five common topics okay so you could just broadly say what do you know about addition or what do you recognize on this page and so that is for the invention page and see if they have any comments. A lot of times uh, my kids might mention something that they recognize, but they're usually pretty quiet about this. So then I have to jump into the five common topics to kind of get the conversation going. So the first is for the five common topics, comparison. So compare the notation that we use. So here's my number line. And let me just put some values on here. And so when we're counting and we're talking about scalar values, we're used to just doing like these little hops. So if I had plus three, I would be thinking about hopping over to three to see where that lands. Now, the other thing though, that they're seeing now and probably for the first time are vectors. And so the vector notation looks like this. And so just pointing out to them the difference in the vector, the difference of vectors is that they have the magnitude and direction. We're on one dimension, so we're only on the number line, so everybody's just moving right or left at this point in time. The vectors are going to be a little bit more obvious when we move into two dimension, and so um, not only are you saying I'm moving by two, but I'm moving by two up in a diagonal in this direction. So um, the vectors will be a little bit more differentiated when we get into two dimension but that's what they just wanna point out there, the difference between the hops versus the vector lines. That's it for comparison. Um, define, okay, so define, I feel like this might take up the most amount of time of this dialectic phase because you might be introducing functions to them for the first time. I felt like that with a lot of the kids in my class and with my own kid. 
So function. And I wrote this up on the board so that my kiddos could follow it. So a function is kind of like a machine that's going to do something. And so we're going to put stuff into the machine, the machine's going to do something, and then it's going to give us something else out of the machine. And so for my example, I likened it to Minecraft because my kiddo and most of the kids in my class were pretty familiar with Minecraft. So I said, what would happen if I took the inputs, and we call these inputs our domain, so what are we putting in here? And what, um, and then we have the function and then we have, we call this the range and this has our outputs. And you're not seeing all that, let's scoot that over. There we go, okay. So in the example for Minecraft, if I took a stick and some cobblestone and I put it into my crafting table. So my crafting table is acting like my function. What did that crafting table do to the stick and cobblestone? What is it going to give out? And I would imagine most of the kids in your class are going to be able to tell you that's going to give you a sword. Um, I don't play Minecraft, so I don't know a lot of other examples, but you might have a few and they can go through a few just to show that they understand how a function works. And so you can also do this with math values. That's pretty much what we're trying to focus on today. So if I did this with math values, I could say that my function is plus two. So whatever number I have, I'm adding two to it in order to get my output value. So if I took the number one and I put it into my function, I'm adding two, what's my output? It's the number three. If I put in the number two, I put it into my function box. It's adding two, so my output would be four. So that's as simple as it is. That's how functions work. And they show you some examples and then they show some inverse functions. So if you went in reverse and you were, your inverse function is subtracting the two, how do you get back? And so they show that on that page. Okay, the next thing for five common topics, if you still have time or you would prefer to cover this instead, under what circumstance are circles open or close on endpoints? Okay, so this is the idea that you have a number line. And if I said that x, our x value, our unknown value is greater than three, and if they haven't seen the greater than and less than signs, just make sure they've seen those before and they understand these are I treat these like little alligator mouths and the alligator always wants to eat the bigger number. So in this case, X is going to be the bigger number, a bigger value than three. And so I know I'm going to be bigger than three. And then in terms of my endpoint or making that mark at the three, I am not including the number three. It is greater than three, it does not include three. So I leave that circle on the endpoint of three open. If it included the three, we would color that in, but we leave it open. So that is the circumstance question. Um, relationship question. This has to do with the um, separated union. So they have a Venn diagram. And if I throw a number line in here and I say this value is uh, negative two, and this value right here is positive two, and here's my zero. Okay, well, let me just throw some values on here. Okay, so if I say I have one X is um, greater than two, and I have an X, so over here I have X is greater than two, and over here I have X is less than negative two, that would be right here. Okay, those are separated. So it's separated, they don't overlap. There's a there's an empty spot over here in the center. But if I were to say that, try to erase this without ruining all my little tip marks and stuff. Okay, if I were to say X is less than two, 
that's going in this direction, and x is greater than negative 2. That one would be in this direction. And now we have this overlapping space where those two are overlapping with each other. That's all it says on that. I don't think I talked about that in my class, but um, that was one of the examples she gave, so that's what it means. And then the last thing is the authority, how a comparison symbol is the authority for graphing on the number line. And so this is back to that thought that if x, um, okay, my example in my lesson plan, I did greater than or equal to three. I'm just gonna do it greater than or equal to one because then I have more room to draw it. So right here, x is going to be greater than one. So it's going to move it in this direction. But I'm saying it's greater than or equal to. See how it has the equal to? That means that this endpoint is a closed circle right there. And there's another way you can write this out. You could write this as um, one is my first value and it is closed or I have inclusion of the one. My next value, this goes on for infinity. I didn't give us an in value, so I'm just going to put infinity and that is open. And so we call that exclusive when it's the open parentheses versus when you have um, this around here, we are including this inclusion. Okay. The next thing is to go through the Memoria and Arrangement page and that's this page. You're seeing a lot of patterns on here. Um, I think it's just important to point out to the kids that they can see the bold words. Those are usually telling them kind of the titles or what type of patterns they're looking at. I think a cool thing to point out, if they look at the iterative addition sequences, which are the ones with the um, little pictures, the triangles, and then the hexagons that keep growing, and then the Fibonacci sequence, they can see that visual pattern and how it repeats, and how cool is it that nature has all of these patterns spread throughout, and it really points to one creator, doesn't it? So that was a fun thing to point out, and I think that's worthwhile to talk about with the kids. And then if you want to introduce um, something on this page, I think I introduced the concept of a summation to my kiddos in class, and um, I don't love the example that they have on this page, so here I'm going to write a very simple example so it's a little easier to follow. So summation means we're going to be adding a bunch of things together. We represent it with sigma. This is the Greek letter sigma, and it looks kind of like a funky E. I'll have my starting index or my number that I'm starting with on the bottom. My ending index is the number that I end with of these values I'm adding together. And what am I adding together? Whatever is told to me in the equation. And in this case, I'm doing 3n. So the way that that looks, I'll write it in a different color, is I will be having, so this means, you know, 3n plus 3n of the next number plus 3n of the next number. So let's go ahead and put in what those numbers are. So this would be 3 times n, but I'm making n be 1. That's my first value. And then I'll also add 3 times, what's the next number after 1? It would be 2. And then 3 times the next number after 2 is 3 and then that's where I'm ending because that was my ending index up here. So I have three times one plus three times two plus three times three. So I have three, six, nine, and that all totals to 18. So in this case, my summation, when starting is at one, ending is at three, and my function or my equation is three n, I get up to 18. So that's just how summation works. And they have a couple problems like that. So it might be helpful to go through that once so that they can see what that looks like. Uh, in terms of the chart, there were some notes about charts and movement. I forget what it was even called. 
I had some notes on my original plans on this about movement, something that she must have mentioned in the video. I didn't fully understand it as I was going back and looking at my notes and I looked on the charts and I still didn't even see it on the charts. So I don't know that that's very important to go over. So I removed that from the latest version of my lesson plan because I just didn't feel like that was, I think it's just confusing to introduce some more stuff to them sometimes. I think the big thing about the charts is just point out that there's a lot of information that they can find on the charts. Be sure that they go to their charts if they don't know a term or how something works because they'll have answers to that in their charts. It does have all the answers. And then um, uh, for the rhetoric part, and so any aha moments, they had never brought back their former homework to go through. I think their parents were mostly going through it with them. So, um, but I would always ask if they had questions. And then we go ahead and would break the kids up. And so um, I would break them up in groups of two. One group would have three, or if one student felt comfortable, they would do it solo because I had seven kids. So I couldn't quite divide it two, two, and two um, all the way for four groups for the top four pages. And while the kids are working together, so this is when the, kid, the class kind of gets loud and stuff. So the kids are working together and I'm trying to write the general info of what's in that top up on the board and then the kids as they work together they need about five to ten minutes they'll solve what they need to solve and then they'll come up and they'll add it onto the board and then all the kids in class are seeing all of the answers for those tops of the first four pages and that's something I really strive to do in every class is make sure that we have those 10 to 15 minutes to just tackle the tops. It gives them some stuff that they have done. It lets them talk to their other peers. And um, sometimes the peers can explain things to each other better than I can to them. So it helps them to hear from each other and uh, helps them feel confident that they already have some of their math done as they're going home for the week to work on it. Uh, we'd go through the catechism real quick. At this point in time, it's pretty much just quickly asking the questions and then they'll um, restate the answers back to you. Um, and that's pretty much it. So that's what the week looks like. I wanted to just throw out there a little bit um, of uh, my little self-promotion here. I have a Math Explorers program that I started. It's pretty much more details of how to tackle a bunch of math concepts with daily videos that go through how to tackle certain math concepts. And then the kids then can feel more confident going into their math math work by themselves doesn't actually show them any of the stuff from MathMap. It doesn't show them the actual problems from MathMap or anything. It's more general concepts. So for the example, for this week, the first lesson that I have for this week goes over um, the addition and subtraction grammar. So, you know, um, an add-end, um, subterhands, minuends, things like that, which they can look that up. That's not super complex. Um, it goes over a little bit on the laws of addition. And so um, for laws of addition, so the uh, commutative law, they know a lot of this stuff. So just kind of going over the laws. And then I think the most important thing though that I go through in my video um, that isn't something necessarily discussed anywhere else is something like where you're having um, double negatives. So, um, you know, and what are you doing when you're adding together numbers, but you're dealing with negative values. And how do you look at that? And do you, would you know how to add that? And you know that those two minuses, the double negatives coming over and becoming a positive. And so that comes together. How like terms have to come together. How if you have a big row of different values and some are positive and some are negative, how do you separate that out so you make sure you're doing the right thing? Because I've seen as the kids kind of get to that algebra stage, they can mess up their whole problem because they did something so simple as add the three and they were supposed to subtract the three. And um, so I just lay it out in a real clear way where we go through and kind of like box together the numbers so that you can see if it's a positive or a negative value and how you need to work those together. So that's my little plug for the Math Explorers program. I'll link to that below, um, but it's on mathexplorers.net and just an example of daily videos going through concepts so that they have those concepts a little bit better in their heads, hopefully, and then it lets them tackle their math a little bit better. So thanks so much for watching. The lesson plan for this video is also in the description, the updated one. And so you can just click the link there and um, find that. Thanks.